we have a global health keynote panel in this room, and you can actually see Adriana from the World Health Organization. So she's the director of medical devices at the World Health Organization at that corner. Um, Hashad is sitting over there. So she, uh, he is the vice president of innovation and, and the medical director for JHP Ego, which is a very large nonprofit who's doing a great deal of work in global health all around the world. Uh, Justin will unfortunately probably not be able to make it. Margaret is a uh, neonatologist from Uganda who flew a long way to come here to give this presentation. And Suma, who is also sitting there, who is the graduate program director and the CBIT director at Hopkins. So without further ado, I'm going to start the uh, uh, global health panel. So I'm going to ask uh, the moderator, Marion. Good morning. OK, see everybody's as, as energetic as I am this morning. Really glad to have you here. We have a great panel. Um, uh, my name is Marion McCord. I'm a professor uh, in biomedical engineering and textile engineering at NC State and also director of global health initiatives for the university. Um, I also bring you greetings from uh, Melissa Beard, who has had a family emergency and wasn't able to be here, um, and she sent her best regards. Um, so we're going to kick off the panel. Um, the, the panel is called uh, Meeting the Needs, and um, I'm sorry, Global Health Technology, Global Health Engineering, and what we're going to talk about is which devices are truly useful in low resource settings, and how do you get input from local stakeholders and bottom of the pyramid stakeholders and involve them from the beginning in decisions that are made? How do you consider issues like uh, infrastructure, uh, the uh, innovation ecosystem in, in a region, and how do you bring that into your development of technology? Um, how can medical uh, technology be used for capacity building and entrepreneurship? in low resource settings, and how can we share information? Can we create a forum through which we are all able to communicate about what we're doing and build upon each other's uh, successes and learn from each other's failures and think about best practices? Um, how can we ensure access to modern health care, and how can we match the needs to the technology that we currently have? So we have a great panel of speakers. Uh, since we're short on time, I'm not going to introduce them again. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, Adriana Velazquez at uh, the World Health Organization. So hello, Adriana. Hello. Welcome. So uh, would you kick us off, please? OK. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mariam, if, if, if you can tell me, if you can see my slide. Got it. Mariam, can you hear me? Can you see my slide? Okay, we've got it. Okay, good. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to link with you. I really wanted to be with you, but it has been impossible, so I'm really glad that Technology allows us to be together for a few minutes. Uh, so I'll give a presentation. I'll go quick through the slides, and uh, I hope we can um, have some discussion later on. So um, as Mariam was saying, what is really important is to really uh, increase access of medical devices that could be innovative, but also appropriate and affordable to the setting. So um, this is really the, the first question. Medical devices are indispensable for healthcare, uh, and uh, we are in the 21st century. Uh, we have been going to the moon, to the ocean, the world, and uh, have PET scanners, medical medicine, nuclear, uh, nuclear medicine. But we still cannot have some really, really essential, uh, affordable, appropriate technology where we most need it. So, how can we all talk? And um, I would like to consider this slide just like the, the most important of all, with a question that is highlighted in green. We all can help. What will each one of you do? Huh? That's the most important part because uh, we, as in the WHO, uh, World Health Organization, we cannot do everything. The industry, the, the academics, but all together. 
So first of all, we just start quickly by um, the definition of the medical devices, making sure that everybody were on the same place. A medical device is any instrument, apparatus, or machine that's able to be used for prevention, diagnosis, or treatment or disease, but even prosthesis or orthoses like restoring or correcting or modifying. You know? So we have intraocular lenses, syringes, hip replacement, scalp pulse, and so. But the costs are rising very much, and we need to allocate the resources in a rational way. So um, for this, there was a World Health Assembly uh, resolution in which uh, we got an approval, and this requires the Director General of the World Health Organization. And then if you want, it requires to do, um, as you can see here, develop guidance and tools, norms and standards, methodological, technical guidance, but most of all, to establish a database of information. So um, Mariam was talking about information sharing. We need to share that information. We need everybody to know it. But uh, the number seven in our uh, World Health Assembly resolution specifically says, to provide support to identify and put in place appropriate medical devices to facilitate access to primary health care. That means starting from the first level on. Uh, we cannot do it alone. I have a very small team here. Uh, by the way, I welcome any interns or, or professors teaching uh, and PhD students. Uh, but, but we have a, a good network, a nice network. We deal with the uh, UN, UN agencies, UNICEF, for example, has an innovation working group. UNFDA, they will be here next week. World Bank, the International Agency of Atomic Energy, we're trying to do radiotherapy equipment for our low resource settings. So these are the UN family. Uh, we have some collaborating centers in different countries, Norway, Senegal, Canada, Malaysia. This is like um, either a university or a center that is developing technology or doing technology and we're linking with them. We have to see the, the regulations of all of them, so we link with the uh, uh, international regulatory agencies like the Global Harmonization Task Force, the uh, Asian Working Party, the International Medical Devices Regulators Forum. Without this regulation, that is the green box in the bottom, we cannot do anything. So I, 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 I raise that issue for you. We also we. <coughs> We have our non-governmental organizations like ISNDE. I, I actually, I should put here sometime in the future. I truly, uh, I know I truly belong to ISNDE, but uh, the, uh, the the formal NGO in official relations with WHO is ISNDE, the International Federation of Hospital Engineering, the Union of Architects, the Society of Radiology, uh, Ultrasound Radiologists and Radiographers, and then we have these yellow boxes that are about memorandums of understanding that we have with health technology assessment agencies around the world that help us uh, verify that we really have to have um, new and innovative technology. No? So I'll go quickly through this slide. It's mostly talking about the global health trend and need for available, affordable, and accessible technology. And uh, I just want to draw your attention that in 2004, the lower respiratory infections were number first in, in rank about the global burden of disease and now they become number two. But others that are ischemic heart diseases, unipolar depressive, uh, cerebrovascular, cancer, road traffic, they now will become the first one. So this is our target audience for all that they are um, um, developing equipment or, or, or uh, technology. And, and this, our target audience is also the low income countries because here we see, for example, cardiovascular diseases, the trends for 2030 will be enormous. Uh, and, and also for uh, other non-communicable diseases like diabetes and cardiology. And if we see the epidemiological changes in the whole, in the whole uh, world, it really is about um, infectious diseases going low and, uh, sorry for that, and uh, non-communicable diseases going high. So we will have much, much dead in, in millions in, in, in uh, cancers and clinical diseases. Then, of course, we still have a, a very big issue about child mortality. And the child mortality is a very, very important issue. We're doing the UN Commission of Life-Saving Commodities. I can share that information with you because we're developing some specific technology to target still maternal death and child mortality. Uh, what is most important of all is that still today, every day, a thousand women die related to childbirth. No, so this is something we cannot accept. This is something it's really, really unbearable, and this is something that will be a, a very important.
target in the next few years. But we still have others, other, dis other disabilities like visual impaired or hearing aids. Today, this morning, we were having here in the virtual meeting about hearing aids and how, um, and actually, the numbers were here. We were talking about um, not even 3% of the population that needs hearing aids have them. No? So there's a big gap, big, big gap. And of course, the ones that get it, they don't have batteries that last enough, they don't have a charger to them, so they cannot use it. No? So visually impaired people will have also these charges. Then we go to cardiovascular diseases, and here you see the map, the, the map take by, the, by themselves. This is female population, this is male population, and these numbers work from 208. Then we have cancer, and cancer, look at these numbers. No? This is um, here on um, cancer death rate. The, it is important to know something. So in this region in Sub-Saharan Africa, the shadows are not so high. Why? Because maybe we haven't detected it. We don't know it is there. We don't we have no diagnosis. So it is a big, big, big problem. So should we, what do we have access to innovative technologies? First of all, we have the needs, the diseases. We have to be sure of the infrastructure that we're having the human resources that are not available, not available, but really the ones that are missing, the surroundings, the social acceptance of the technology, the uptake and the demand. On the side of the solutions, we have to have something really, really practical, easy to use, adapted to local infrastructure, affordable, available, accessible, safe, and effective. And these words, affordable, available, and um, accessible, we use them all the time. It's, it's our four aims. You know? um, then we did a study in which um, Jack participated and some people also from the uh, United States. We have more than uh, one many countries participating. In, in, it's talking about local production or technology transfer of medical devices to see how can we do to really reach out. And we did this study in these countries, Brazil, China, Ethiopia, India, and Jordan. And then we find 10 success stories. I'll just show you some of them, like the Jaipur food in India, that's uh, the new prosthetic that made of locally sourced materials. We have telemedicine units, intraocular lenses. This is a drawn device. It's assisted retinal delivery, and this is still in clinical trials. The solar ear is about a solar-powered hearing aid for those that cannot have a battery, etc. Uh, and then we did a call for innovative technologies in 2010. We launched it. In 2011, we got 44. In 2012, we got 60. And we're launching it again next week. So if any of you want uh, to have a, a, uh, their devices in, in, uh, presented in a WHO book, this is the opportunity. This is, um, for example, a soft power pulse oximeter. I just took one example, but there are 100 or more than 100 now in the website. And um, that, that mainly says the problems that need to be addressed, the product description, functionality, and where it can be found. And all of these are in this book that's called Medical Devices uh, and Health Solutions Company for Innovative Healthcare, Health Technologies, uh, and this is um, uh, available on our website. And uh, this is the people that participated in a, in a survey, in, in our survey. And uh, just to go very quickly through that, I will tell you that uh, the, the people that were responding to the survey were everything. People that do research, design, intellectual, regulation, technician, or people from reimbursement. Uh, and this is the, the main barriers are um, lack of financial resources for development. But then the second one is lack of financial incentives. The market, the market that feels potential return is investment. Those are the main two concerns. So what can we do to diminish that? Uh, the ratio of developers who have transferred the medical devices to low resource centers was um, 39. And we have a barriers of commercializing, which is mainly financing, but we have the second and third ones that are very, very important, the regulatory clearance and the production and manufacturing line. Um, we, uh, some of them, they said, well, um, maybe it was very complex, the regulation, the competition, so I couldn't go to the you know? And uh, we thought that the partnership was really the best way to reach success. But what we are worried about is this, um, the lack of political will and lack of incentives. Because if there are no incentives to innovate, why should we innovate? So, um, and the procurement, 
why are these devices not procured when once you did them, you develop them, finally you get them to the market? And well, because sometimes, uh, first of all, lack of information. So the, the devices are there, but as we don't have a really big market and, and, and uh, something, that, so um, a commercialization um, uh, activities, so nobody knows that we have them available and they don't buy it. And the second one is that um, in some countries they prefer proven products and they say, well, we just need the, the normal brand and I'm not going to experiment with a new one. Also, this is this slide I think it is uh, most important for our concerns now. Uh, the barriers are for governance and cost of medical devices, but uh, and lack of property trained staff to maintain equipment. Some of these, um, unfortunately, are equipment that there was never done a good needs assessment. So they didn't really uh, in, talk with all the stakeholders to make sure that their device would be well, uh, well accepted. You know? So to avoid all these things, we did a feasibility tool. And this tool contains um, some sections about how much the device is needed, assessment recommendations, all the things that you need to consider in order to really develop an equipment. And we did some trials on some um, devices already. And uh, now we're really concerned on how to use those devices in different uh, healthcare settings, so health health centers, district hospitals, specialized hospitals. And to really include those devices now in our list of essential medical devices by healthcare facilities so that people can recognize them and use them and then put them in, the, in our uh, core medical equipment uh, uh, information. And so the conclusion is that we have to design, develop, manufacture, and provide solutions that meet the needs of the population. That's the most important thing. Not to impose the technology, but because sometimes it might not be appropriate to low resource settings. Network and research so that we can share information with all, be open-minded, have empathy of what they need, uh, have uh, approved social acceptance in the way that they were going to use to be affordable, but also remember of business-oriented, that will consider good health outcomes and consider really the patient of the final user. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it is useful and I'll continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. I, I realize I uh, want to shake things up a little bit here because Adriana has to leave us. Is she gone already? Adriana? Yes, Mariam. I'll try to stay as long as possible, but, but yes, eventually I'll have to lead to another meeting. I was, I was wondering, Adriana, if you could take a couple of questions before you sign off. Yes, of course. Because of course, Adriana has work. to leave us, and then we'll invite the rest of our panel uh, to continue and have our, the rest of our questions after. Okay, do we have any specific questions for uh, Adriana? Um, Adriana, I had, a, I had a question. Oh, go ahead, Margaret. Thank you very much, Adriana. Uh, I wanted to, to know, you've said that there are 44 technologies out there, but uh, we haven't seen them yet. Uh, where are they? Uh, we have them in the, in the continuum of new and emerging technologies. Um, they were in and it's, um, this slide that um, we have in here. They are in, the, in, the, in our um, here. This compendium, this compendium is available in the website. So we send already, 40, uh, we send the, the document with 44 to all the ministers of health, and now we are in the process of uh, consolidating this one and we'll send it. But most of these stages, they they talk specifically about these devices, where are they available? In the, in the bottom of this page, then you will see where are the devices being marketed already, and what is the, uh, the approximate price, and uh, if they have been, if the regulations have been approved. And this link, I can send it to all of you so that you can have it and, and look at it. Any other questions for Adriana? Adriana, I was wondering, um, what, looking at the the, the explosion of non-communicable diseases as our biggest global health threat. Um, I know we have a lot of, we're working on a lot of diagnostic technology, but um, what are we doing in terms of devices for, for treatment and, and where do we stand on that? 
Uh, there, Mariam, there are many things. There are devices for diagnostics, but also devices for treatment. So um, I'll just tell you one example. We, we want to do the newborn screen for hearing aid, but uh, for, for, for deaf of hearing, but we're also um, trying to do the hearing aid. Uh, and we are developing um, uh, better tools to diagnose cancer, but we're also working on um, cryotherapy um, units, low, very low cost, to be able to take care of cancer patients. No? So we are really looking at the whole spectrum, even palliative care. We're talking with the International Agency of our Atomic Energy to find uh, uh, the way to use cobalt pumps for palliative care for patients that uh, cannot, uh, cannot be operated or something from cancer. So we're really going all the way, Maria, in different products. Thank you, Adriana. Any other questions? Yes, one more. Can you take a microphone, please? Okay, we'll repeat the question for Adrian. Um, I was just going to ask, so it seems like one way to go is really like developing guidelines and like compiling lists of medical devices and all of that. Um, are there specific areas that you guys are looking at and are you looking at the same thing for the other countries to Adriana? Oh, okay, well, I didn't write it down, but I think the, the gist of it is, does WHO actually have people on the ground in country to help uh, both with needs assessment and implementation, use of devices, et cetera? Um, thank you for your question. This is really important. Um, so this, I'll, I'll just show you, this is a book that's called um, I don't know if you can see it here. It's a baseline country survey on medical devices. And what we have here is we go country by country. Uh, and we have specific focal points. So, for example, here Saudi Arabia. And then we have the focal point. Who is the focal point in, our, in Saudi Arabia? These are people that are currently working in the Ministry of Health. So we try to link... Uh, sorry. Uh, we, we try to link... Um, We try to link with um, different people in different countries that are established there. There are not people up to, there are not WHO people. There are people working in the Ministry of Health. There are people working in academics. We have the network of the IFMB. IFMB is International Federation of Medical and Biological Engineering. So we have national professional societies, and we link with them. We send them their information. No? So WHO by itself has a WHO office in 100 countries. 140 countries, but there is not one like a biomedical engineer to take care of that. The biomedical engineers that we're linking with are working in the ministries of health inside the, the, the ministry. And what we do is do workshops with them. We send them information. They all belong to a listserv, so we send them information um, continuously. And we do workshops with them. I was just in uh, Tanzania with all the Eastern, uh, Eastern African countries, so we had a meeting with all of them and all the, the, the biomedical engineers from the government. I don't know if this answers your question. Thank you very much, Adriana. Thanks for participating. We're going to move on to our next uh, speaker, who is um, Margaret. And um, Margaret. Thank I you very much, Margaret. Thank you. I'll try to stay <laughs> on the line to hear the other presentations. And, and I welcome you all in WHO and to send emails for anything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Margaret Nakakitu Kijumbu, uh, from, who is a neonatologist uh, from Kampala, Uganda. And um, I'm going to let Margaret take it. And each of the rest of the panelists will speak for five, hopefully, to five minimum, 10 maximum minutes, and then go sit up here in the front, and then we'll have <coughs> questions. Is this you? Do you have a presentation? Yes, it is. This is it? Not good at this time. OK. One? Yeah. No. Okay. This. Yes. It was taking my time. Yep. Great. Okay. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> my name is Margaret. Well, um, I'm 
one of those who comes from the developing countries. I think I just want to give you a picture of what is uh, going on. You are developing technologies for us, uh, but you have to know what exactly is happening. So, um, so in my work, Initially, the country decided to do a needs assessment in the newborn uh, sector to find out what are the gaps in the uh, uh, healthcare for the neonates. So after uh, I used to work as the director of the neonatal care, uh, the NICU in Kampala at the teaching hospital, uh, however, I retired from that so that I can start working throughout the country. This is a rural district in Uganda, and that's where I decided to try to pilot the work I do. Okay, he has something to do. But uh, as we, we realized that there is a Many of the people in the situation analysis did not know how to care for newborns, and the infrastructure was hardly there for care of the newborns. So we decided <coughs> to start neonatal survival programs, and we realized that the preterm accounted for almost 25%, and we wanted a broader and holistic approach uh, was needed to effective intervention strategies to improve the newborn. Uh, there was no clinical services, there were no records of outcome, there were no resources for managing high risk, the district health plans did not even include anything in, in, in the care for the newborn. So in 2006, we started this, I started the intervention in this district to improve survival by strengthening the capacities of the existing health system infrastructure to provide accessible and affordable health care for the high risk, sick, and preterms. And uh, so the process was really long. Uh, we had to advocate because it's like nobody cared whether the newborn survived or not. The, the policy makers were not like in their heads thinking whether they should do something about the newborn. There was a lot for maternal. They cared about the, the mother, but nobody realized the mother wanted a, a, a live baby. Then um, a series of meetings with stakeholders, we had to go through meetings to try to convince them that the baby, we had to do something about the baby. And uh, we made that the beneficiaries should formulate their vision. What did they want to see? What did they? Uh, and then we started designing an implementation plan with the district uh, health teams. And um, I have to be a little faster because I want to show you. So uh, we pulled resources from different programs because this is somewhere where there was no budget. So what did we want to do? We know HIV had a lot of money. Uh, People had money for, for various things, the ICCM, the MCI, IMCI. So we started pulling resources so that we can get to the newborn because we know everybody before they become a child, they started as newborns. And this really helped us to, to reach out to the newborn. Um, so we started by community mapping. There are resources out there, but nobody knows that they are there, especially the human resource. We had to map the whole district, find out who is there, out there, down in the rural areas, who, who can provide the, 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 the care for the newborn. Then training at all levels of the healthcare, uh, including the community health workers. And then we established the community, infra, the infrastructure at the district hospital. So as a well of results, we saw that uh, the services we are now integrated into the district health system. Uh, we, these were the, the, the different, uh, in the mapping, the community, we found family clinics, small, small clinics distributed all over the district. They were private for profit, and these were 116. <laughs> and the, you can see that the, the 
what do we call it, that the public sector has very few, and yet in our governments, the private sector is hardly looked at. So you can imagine these are the people who are giving the services and uh, nobody knows where they are. So we started off by training the, the health workers. These are some of the training in research station uh, of the newborn and, uh, uh, and then we, the, down there, uh, the research station area, we created a small room in this district hospital. There was nothing. This was a room for the nurses to change their clothing. It is next to the maternity ward. So we created and created a room for the newborn. And here we started the follow-up clinic for the, new, the newborns and preemies in the sister's office. This is the, the matron's office. So we turned it into one uh, on a Tuesday. We ran a clinic. This was to avoid... Uh, creating new structures. There's a lot of structure you can turn it around and use it. And uh, we provided the autoclave for infection control, the water the, in the small room, and uh, these are some of the things the mother there is practicing kangaroo care uh, in the hospital. And uh, you can see uh, we teach the, the, because the newborns, we feed them, we teach these midwives and nurses how to insert the NG tube. This is a mother who is trying to, to the express breast milk and then they feed their babies. Um, the mother is expressing breast milk. I'm showing you this so that you see why I came up now. We need technologies to help this, this system. And uh, this is a mother, you can see she, she's struggling to express milk. Uh, by hand, we don't have the, the machines like you have in the US, and uh, these are community programs. Now, uh, I want to show you now, let's go to, I want to go to the, I have another sort of slides, now to show you the innovation. So having had this, and I saw it was a problem, I went out to, uh, we had the collaboration, I want to change that. Sure. Come on, keep going on. Columbia <laughs> University, and when the professor visited us, I said, he said, Margaret, what do you want me to help you with? I said, I want you to help me with some low-cost technologies to monitor babies and to manage them because we don't have the human resource. Which one would you like, please? This one. This one, okay. So... We developed a partnership with Columbia University so that we can develop low, uh, some technologies to help us uh, help the babies. So um, I just want to show you this is Columbia. I don't want. So we, this is a team we have been working with. Uh, this is uh, Professor Aaron and Elizabeth Hillman. They, they are the partners in Columbia and the Biomedical Engineering Department. And Yvonne is my mentor. She is in the University of uh, California, San Diego. And uh, we started off by communicating, um, teleconferencing each other. I was giving them the background of what is the situation like? What is the infrastructure? What do we have in place? And uh, so I just want to show you. So. Uh, one uh, last year, they visited uh, Uganda to come and see the real thing because they, they couldn't imagine what they, they are going to make for us because they didn't know exactly what was going on. So we fostered this collaboration between th the two groups and uh, they visited this to the, the Department of uh, Engineering. Uh, 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 what is it? Uh, this is a, I'm an engineering department, in Makere University. And the uh, biomedical engineering department is going to be started at uh, the School of Medicine. Uh, so I started off this modular incubator, so I gave them what I really wanted at that particular time. I realized that babies were born in the villages and they could not reach where the services were. So I said, can you make me something which can transport babies warm to the center? And secondly, I need something which can monitor the baby's temperature, 
We can monitor the heart rate. We can monitor the, the, um, the heart rate and we want to monitor the, the oxygen saturation and the, the temperature. So the students came up with a, uh, a design and uh, down there is where they started the innovations of uh, uh, their machines. So we started off with, they called it the bundle up, the neonatal transport unit. And this is, uh, they, they went into the details, I don't know engineering, but they had to make sure that the temperatures were correct. But uh, what came out, you see that bag? They came up with a bag like that, and inside the bag, I don't know whether I have, inside that bag, there's a pocket, and they had a gel, which solidifies when it's outside, and you can dip it in hot water, and it becomes a gel, a soft gel. You put it into the pocket inside that bag, and it, <coughs> it remains at 37 degrees centigrade for two hours. So you could transport the baby once you put, and all that material, insulating material, it provides warmth to the baby, and you can keep the baby warm from one station to another so that they arrive when they are, they are okay. And uh, we have test, they, they have brought it to and forth Uganda so that the, 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 the nurses can have a feel of what they can tell the mothers, okay? And uh, the cost of producing this will be fi around $50. And uh, so it is uh, way cheaper. This is one of the nurses trying it out and <coughs> trying to wa work around it. And uh, this, we started also uh, a phototherapy unit. Jaundice is very uh, is a problem in our area, and uh, this, we started the unit inside that incubator. You can see that is the tree. You can put the stand inside the incubator. We don't have space, so if you started. The, the, you know, like in the U.S., you have all these stands up and down, but we don't have space, so we want something which can fit in the court, which can fit in the incubator, and another one, we are mounting it on the wall. So all this, we had to come up with things which are innovative so that we do not uh, waste space. And uh, this one will cost about $152, sorry. And... Um, then we have the, the, the monitor. That is the monitor. That is the mattress, which we are going to, uh, it uses the pressure phenomena. The baby lies onto that mattress, and uh, they are, all the, the probes are inside that mattress, and then they go to that small uh, uh, box. It has three uh, lights will come on, one for temperature, one for heart rate, and the other one for respiration. So. It can make an alarm. It is very simple. It doesn't need uh, 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 any complicated. This is the science. Of, uh, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know. But this one will cost around, th this was the student who headed this one. And uh, this, this one will cost around $152. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I am hoping that you saw the mother expressing breast milk. I'm hoping that we shall have a cheap breast pump so that we are, so I'm pulling, clinical pool. I'm trying to pull anybody who can, and then we are looking for local uh, companies or small entrepreneurship groups to produce some of these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Margaret. Next, I want to bring up our next speaker. Unfortunately, Justin Bellata will not be able to make us make it. Uh, he's traveling, and, and he thought he could take some time, but he's not able to make it. So our next speaker is going to be uh, Harshad. And uh, Harshad asked that I not introduce him. Run up here, Harshad. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, you I, won't I waste time? really running for time, yes. so I'm, I'm, I'm going to right, oh, I gotta fix my... Somebody's going to have to help me with this. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to make it real quick, and I'll trim down my presentation considerably, but I, I did want to um, share with you some few thoughts. 
just very quickly, uh, JAPAIGO is an organization that works in many, many countries, in almost 60 countries right now, uh, largely translating what you guys develop and take it to scale. Um, and we have been very successful as an organization. Uh, we started 40 years ago, we took laparoscopy to the developing world, and I think it's one of those things that we took to uh, almost 90% of the world's medical school. So huge coverage. I don't believe there's anything that we have done since that has had that kind of coverage. For me, the big aspects of what we need to be able to do is to work towards large coverage. Um, so in designing solutions, from my perspective, we need to understand the context in which we are working. Uh, okay, everybody, nobody should get hurt, but my second uh, point on this one is that our technology or our test must be reasonably accurate and effective. I, I am completely comfortable with not developing super duper technologies which will serve and solve 100% of the problem. Uh, let me give you an example. In sexually transmitted infections, we use the syndromic approach uh, in developing nations. In other words, from symptoms, we go straight to therapy. And we might try blunderbuss therapy. In other words, we'll try out the six drugs that will uh, cover all aspects of vaginal discharge and then hope that one of them has cured the problem uh, because we don't have the diagnostic tools. Or we'll do sequential therapy till we have gotten to the right one. Neither of those things are really good because we don't have very good diagnostic. Our syndromic management is only as good as tossing a coin. So if we can get a 75% sensitive test, that would be in itself a massive uh, improvement uh, in what we got. For me, that's really important. The next part of it is uh, probably my biggest point on this is uh, because in developing nations almost 50% of people do not reach facilities. We have to think about taking tests to women, children, and uh, families as opposed to expecting them to come to those facilities which are very, very far, very distant, and very few. So it becomes very important that our technologies need to be very simple, very low cost, um, and my students uh, uh, almost pull out my hair because every technology I want developed has to be less than $10. Um, and actually it's possible. Um, they would be completely low complex because we, we are trying to shift the kind of tasks that physicians do here to nurses and community workers. Think about that. Uh, we can actually achieve that. And they need to be, be actually fairly high quality uh, because we cannot afford to replace products fairly frequently in developing nations. So one of my most important points is we need to make it easier for people to do the right thing. Uh, if I want health workers to wash their hands, if there's only one sink in the entire hospital, nobody's going to wash their hands. So our technology to do that is alcohol rubs that I can make available right next to the patient. So there are very simple things that one can do that can get fairly dramatic uh, in case. Now, how many of you read Malcolm, uh, read Malcolm uh, Gladwell, the tipping point? He says two things. He says, we have lots of knowledge, but we don't have understanding. Unfortunately, many of the technologies we are trying to develop are based on knowledge, not on understanding. Let me give you a really good example here. This is our knowledge regarding postpartum hemorrhage, the biggest killer of women in developing nations. Uh, we know that it accounts for more deaths than any other cause. We know that most of postpartum hemorrhage is preventable. We know that a procedure that can be done by a nurse, a midwife, can save their lives. That evidence has been available for 25 years. But we also know that only 50% of births in developing nations occur in facilities where there's a skilled professional provider. Um, and even in the skilled, uh, in, in facilities, uh, only 30% of the people actually get this procedure, which can be life-saving. And finally, we also know that emergency treatment is very far away from where women actually have postpartum hemorrhage. And if you spend two or three hours having postpartum hemorrhage, then you could actually die from it before you even get to the facility. So that's our knowledge. We can design solutions based on that knowledge, but I would urge us to design our solutions based on the understanding, and this is my understanding. To eliminate preventable postpartum hemorrhage, we need to address both births that occur at facilities as well as the 50% of births that occur at home. To me, that's really important. Uh, 
So no amount of improvement, fine tweaking uh, at the facility level, improving tamponades, improving all kinds of technologies at the facility level is going to solve the problem because the biggest problem for postpartum hemorrhage is not in hospitals, it's actually at home. So our technologies need to be able to address those kinds of issues. So I'll skip this slide. Now, here's the big challenge, and I'm specifically talking about emergency of obstetric care, but I, I believe this applies for almost everything in healthcare in developing nations. There are several delays in getting care. The first delay is in recognition of conditions at home. Okay, right, thank you. <laughs> so we have, we have great delays in recognition and decision making at home. Um, then we have delay to get the person to care. And finally, even at facilities, there are delays in person receiving the care uh, because there are so many barriers, there are so many failures. So we can, we can try out a number of things. We can try and move families and facilities closer, families and uh, women closer to facilities, or we can move care closer to where women are. And I believe that the big transformational changes in Africa and Asia, I come from Africa, I'm Kenyan, um, will come actually from taking care to people rather than waiting for people to overcome geography and floods and waters and everything else. My son is an emergency room physician in New Jersey. This weekend he is going to take care to many people in Staten Island and other places because they cannot get to care. Think about that. We are facing a similar kind of problem, but that is a common problem every day in developing nations, people who cannot get to care. So our technologies, our transformational technologies are the ones I believe are the ones which allow us to take care to where women, children, mothers, everybody is. So doing it right. I, I think that Beth Health is not about the best technology or care that exists. It's about the best care that we can take to majority of people who need it, regardless of where they are. So here are some examples. Uh, this picture is from Rahim, he's Rahim. He is not a doctor, he's not a nurse, he's just an orderly, but we have trained him how to do newborn resuscitation. He has probably assisted at 300 resuscitations of newborns in his institution in Afghanistan. Now, look at the technology that he has got. And uh, um, when I look at this technology, I said, here's a technology which has got about 60 moving parts. If a little part of this resuscitation device, this bag and mask device, uh, uh, disappears, then our entire technology is gone. So which idiot developed this technology? <laughs> so, I'm sorry. But the, the point is, if you've got 60 moving parts, then it's, it's absolutely not going to work in this environment, all right? I need to watch the baby's chest rise up and down when I'm doing resuscitation. We've got a technology which covers the chest because it is at right angles like this. The very thing that I want to observe, if it was an inline resuscitator, then it would work better. So we haven't done improvements in this technology for 20 years. We haven't. And these kinds of technologies need improvement. Uh, right there. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. Um, these are our nurses, female nurses, performing male circumcision. Folks, 70 million male circumcisions need to be done just this year to turn the tide against HIV. We don't have today a very good technology, a simple technology to perform adult male circumcision. Our nurses are doing actually a marvelous job. We've got programs in 10 countries. Uh, almost a million circumcisions have been done just this year by nurses, by frontline workers, but it's still a big slog. If you had a simple technology, which I believe there's one right around the corner, we can actually make a big difference. The next picture up there is our nurses detecting cervical cancer. Uh, we developed a test many years ago, visual inspection using vinegar. We apply vinegar to the cervix, we look at the cervix, if there are white lesions, we know that there's likelihood of cervical dysplasia, and the nurse can provide cryotherapy right now. Now, cryotherapy as an equipment, folks, was developed 40 years ago. Uh, in technology terms, I think that's like using the abacus. Um, we've done nothing to improve that technology. And if we want, we, that's a really good uh, technology for us to be able to move uh, our things forward. So uh, I, I, my colleague will actually describe a technology that we are working on right now. 
the last picture here is a lay volunteer going house to house doing HIV tests. So when we introduced home testing with non semi-literate or non-literate community workers going house to house, our adoption of HIV testing went up from 10% in the community to 80% near universal coverage. We believe that taking some of these tests, some of these abilities out there in the field can uh, really make things better. All right, so there's uh, some technology problem right there. We have that all the time in developing nations. Um, <laughs> now, why am I showing you these examples? I'm showing you these examples because in every one of these cases, if we were smarter, if we were better, then we would develop the technologies that are appropriate for that level of use, that make it easier for these workers who are semi-literate, non-literate, or uh, uh, just uh, at the most basic level in their health careers to be able to do really, really good things, really, really effective things. And this is a slide that I love to show. I worked in Nepal for many, many years. Um, Nepal's maternal mortality ratio in 1998 was 539. I did those studies on that uh, very, very uh, elegant study. And we repeated the study in 2009. Nepal is one of those countries which is actually on track to reach the Millennium Development Goals. But what I wanted you to notice was the proportion of births that are occurring with skilled professional providers in the same period. We all believe that we require professional providers uh, to do this. In Nepal, this reduction in maternal mortality occurred even though the proportion of births with skilled birth attendants increased only from 17% to 19%. In other words, almost all of their gains were done by what I talked about earlier, taking care to women. Uh, one such example uh, is prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Very simple. Now, there are many opportunities. One opportunity, for example, is the more than two million uh, nurses and other health and professionals who are not, by definition, skilled birth attendants, but who could provide care. Uh, now, raise your hands how many of you were trained in, in CPR in in school, right? So if I was to fall down just now, I'm sure some of you would be able to resuscitate me. So that's CPR. We can apply the same kind of principle to life-saving techniques in developing nations. So this is our training program that's training frontline workers in doing fairly complex technology. So it's a training technology. Uh, very, uh, we work with a, with a company called Lada, uh, and we have developed some very low-cost simulators that are appropriate for these uh, 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 levels and very, very dramatic results. So I'm going to end now by just two uh, other thoughts. Uh, now, this is an incredibly complex slide. Don't worry about the complexity of this slide. My main point here is that building technologies uh, will not make people use them. There is a massive amount of work needed beyond building those technologies, including actions that we have to take at the global level, at the national level, at program implementation level, at individual level, and a variety of all of those things. Why am I telling you this? I think that as you develop your technologies, it's not just sufficient for you to work with clinicians. You need to work with public health groups, industrialization groups, regulated groups up front, not sequentially, up front, so that you can solve many of these problems as you are developing this technology. This is very crucial and critical for me. All right, my last point. And this, I think, for, uh, is something that my students tell me all the time. They do both US-type projects as well as uh, developing country projects. And they tell me that developing simple, very low-cost technologies that are effective is actually far more challenging than developing complex technologies. It's actually easier to develop complex technologies than <laughs> low-cost, effective, simple technologies. So it's a big challenge. And our students are eager, or you as very, very uh, eminent Engineers are very eager to find challenges. This is a great challenge. And if you address this challenge, we can bring about transformational change. But we cannot do it without creative partnerships. So one last point on this. Um, right now I have heard that there are 12 groups working on a phototherapy device. There are another 20 groups working on um, uh, some breastfeeding device and kangaroo mother care, et cetera, and whatnot. We really cannot afford that. I think that if all 12 of them suddenly came up with products at the end of this thing, we in the global health community do not have the energy or the ability to test all of those solutions out, find which is the best one and whatnot. It is much better that 
each one of us finds our niche areas to work in. There is a huge amount of work and, and, and collect collaboratively work towards certain themes. Uh, that will really get us there faster. Uh, so thank you so much and I'll be happy to chat with everybody uh, at the end of this. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Would you go sit at the Thank you, Harsh. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, Soumya Acharya. Uh, and Soumya is going to follow up on Harsh's discussion. Thank you. This is for you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we actually are going to run until 10 o'clock, so have no fear. You'll have time to, answer, to ask questions. Okay, great. Otherwise, I thought I only had two more minutes. So. I want to sort of take off from where Harsh had left it. Uh, uh, we are the Johns Hopkins Center for Bioengineering Innovation and Design, uh, a center within, uh, within the biomedical engineering department. But uh, we, talk, we work very closely with JAPAIGO. Um, you know, our entire global health program is actually uh, in close collaboration and partnership with JAPAIGO. And a lot of our learning and our, and our uh, orientation towards how we approach uh, development of new innovations in the global health space is really shaped by some of the things that you heard. Uh, so uh, just very briefly about who we are. Uh, we are. We are about education and development of uh, healthcare innovation leaders, but also in our mission statement is the creation and early stage development of healthcare solutions. So we have a dual mission as a center and uh, the uh, so and we take both those parts of the mission fairly, uh, fairly seriously. So it's not just uh, uh, training uh, f by doing some Mickey Mouse project, if you will, but while you are training in the process, you actually hopefully have done some, some good. So I'll specifically focus on our, the global health innovation part of our program, and as I mentioned, we work uh, in very close partnership with JAPAIGO. So just, uh, this is actually a quote from Mark Twain that sort of uh, uh, amplifies what you just said, Harshad. There's a letter he wrote to his friend, said that, I'm sorry this letter is so long, I didn't have time to make it shorter. <laughs> and, and the point is that the process of making something simple and elegant is actually takes a lot more thought, a lot more creativity, a lot more ingenuity. Uh, it's always, as engineers, it's always easy to over-engineer and put a lot more bells and whistles. That's what we are trained to do by, you know, by instinct. So here's an example. Uh, taking a, uh, that, uh, that point of, uh, you know, if we truly want to make transformational impact, we can wait another 50 years for all women to come to facilities to have anti their antenatal checkup or do something with that current reality, which is in many countries, 50 to up to 80 percent women never receive an antenatal checkup and, and uh, you know, routine things like preeclampsia um, can be detected by simple tests and which is the reason why you seldom hear of eclampsia and pre severe preeclampsia in the Western world. The reason is you get tested for it if you're pregnant. It gets detected and it gets taken care of. Uh, and the method for detecting this is actually fairly simple. You have the blood pressure device, gestational hypertension, and protein in the urine. So you have the urine dipsticks. This is what you get if you went to, you know, a medical, a medical center or went to visit your obstetrician. So, how do we now take this care out to the last mile? How do we equip community health workers who actually do have access to women within their communities, how do we equip them to do this simple test and therefore be able to detect at the community level those 5% or 8% women who will develop this uh, you know, deadly condition? Uh, we, we realize that the current technologies, they are relatively inexpensive. The BP cuff is not very expensive. The protein test is somewhat expensive in the U.S., but it's actually not appropriate for interpretation. So you need, you need a, a, a container to, uh, to uh, hold the urine. Uh, the, the, the dipstick color change is actually not dichotomous. It's a gradual change. So you have to compare in a dim, dim lit scenario. So we made some simple changes to this. Basically, uh, uh, the, the, the BP device became a simple semi-automatic, it's actually still work in progress, but it's probably evolving towards a semi-automatic uh, uh, blood pressure cuff that runs off of a cell phone battery that not only gives a number as an output, but actually gives a 
red light, green light, yellow light sort of an indicator such that a semi-literate uh, health worker can actually uh, give the appropriate type of counseling to the woman based on the output from the device. It's intended to be robust and everything. The dipstick uh, has been, yeah, it was interesting. We challenged our students uh, with, you know, can you come up with a low cost, you know, protein test that's dichotomous in color and that doesn't require that you, uh, you know, have a container for the urine. And instead of trying to make a simpler protein dipstick, what they really did was they re-engineered the biochemistry of the test, which is fairly well known and in the public domain, put it in liquid form and loaded it up on a highlighter pen. So we have the protein pen. Health worker carries it with them and they make a mark on a piece of paper, give it to the woman to, you know, urinate on it in her privacy. And the body of the pen is the control color, cap of the pen is the test positive color. This is, of course, a picture of a prototype. And it's a very dichotomous test. We have now, with Jepaigo, we've uh, now finished about, I think, three rounds of uh, testing at various tiers of the healthcare system in Nepal. And it turns out that the sensitivity and specificity of this test, which, by the way, costs about one-third cent per test, is, uh, is almost two times, it's actually n uh, much higher, substantially higher than the t protein test that you can purchase at CVS Pharmacy uh, today. It's still under development, of course. So this is an example of, this is not rocket science, this is not some breakthrough nano microfluidic uh, space shuttle innovation, but it's an appropriately designed uh, innovation that actually could get adopted, and if it does get adopted, it might make a substantial difference. Another example, the, the whole point of de-skilling and task shifting. In the United States, uh, if you're in labor about to give birth, it's typically an obstetrician in a big facility with their army of residents and fellows who are taking care of you. Uh, not quite so in uh, many scenarios in developing countries. Uh, if you're in, in a facility, you're probably a skilled birth attendant or a midwife is attending to you. Uh, and uh, what I have up here is something known as a partogram. This was a tool that was developed by uh, World Health Organization and various organizations. and it's, it's actually been around for almost 25 years now. It's a paper graph. It's a graph paper that as you're managing labor, you're supposed to fill it out every 15 minutes or every half an hour as you assess the woman and the progress of labor and, you know, fetal heart rate, cervical dilation, things like that. If you fill out the partogram in real time, it is supposed to assist you in decision making. You, are, you, are, you know, there is enough evidence, is an evidence-based tool that where the partogram has been used, the ability to detect and predict obstructed labor and other complications of pregnancy in a timely manner goes up dramatically. So that has been proven in several studies. WHO advocates this, and this is part of national guidelines, I believe, in 120 countries in the part of midwifery training, obstetrics training. So what's the problem? It's supposed to be such a wonderful tool. So Jepaigo approached us, uh, I think, two years back and said, well, we know it's a great tool. This is, you know, they convinced us this awesome tool said, you know, for the life of us, we cannot get our midwives to use it. Please figure out why and do something about it. So it's a classic, you know, user interface design sort of a challenge. And long story short, we realized that, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of issues with the partogram, the ability to plot it in real time in that busy labor and delivery uh, room, the ability to interpret it uh, appropriately, even if you did plot it, especially if you're a, a fresh junior level midwife. And then the ability just to remember and to do something with it. All of these combine, and so the usage of the partogram is dismal in many facilities, uh, as low as 10%, 8% at times. So long story short, we sort of had various product concepts. One of them was, you know, how about we put the paper partogram on a digitizing board, and then, you know, it actually reminds you. This is a microcontroller and everything. As you fill it out, uh, gets digitized. Uh, all the algorithms, all the decision making that, uh, you know, is known to most any obstetrician is fed into the microcontroller. It prompts you, suggests actions, alerts, things like that. Another product concept was just a, you know, Kindle type of a partogram. So it's a custom electronic device where you have, where you don't have to plot anymore. You just enter the numbers uh, directly and the plotting is done automatically on the screen. And in the middle you see, you know, uh, uh, Android tablet, seven inch Android tablet based partogram. This is this is one of the concepts that we are now uh, aggressively moving forward. Uh, there's actually two groups that is now taking this to the more mature design phase and we are going to be 
testing this. We have actually one of the uh, one of the things in our process is there are several rounds of field iterations involved. This is not in isolation. So we've gone out to Kenya, we've gone out to uh, spoken to midwives in Nepal and, and India, and all that understanding feeds right back into how we go about doing things. This is another uh, device. Uh, it's a no, it's a no, cell phone connected non-invasive hemoglobinometer. Uh, the whole goal is that health workers, the same community health workers, can be equipped with this tool, which uh, could be fairly inexpensive. Uh, you plug it onto the fingertip, and using now well-known principles of hemoglobin assessment, plethysmographic assessment of hemoglobin, uh, the low-end cell phone of a health worker gets converted to this non-invasive hemoglobinometer. You know, leveraging the computational power of the phone as well as the display capability of the phone, you get in 30 seconds, you get, you know, the hemoglobin number and you also um, get like a red, green, yellow light. Plus this device, since it's on a cell phone, actually s reports this data as a summary SMS in the background to a central server. And a Google map of real-time anemia statistics uh, in the country is now populated. So, so this, this has a implication for, um, you know, s screening. Uh, uh, by the community health worker, but it also has implications for, uh, you know, your quality monitoring, public policy, um, uh, and things like that, because a higher level uh, health official can now actually follow up, if need be, uh, on each of the cases of anemia that are in their country. Uh, I'll skip over this one. This is, again, uh, a device for emergency management of postpartum hemorrhage, and this is probably the last one. You mentioned cryotherapy, so I just want to end with this example, where for cervical cancer, which you know about a uh, quarter of a million women every year uh, die of cervical cancer, almost none of them in the United States and Europe because they receive their routine pap smear, right? And you get detected, it's a slow progressing precancerous stage, it, it's easily detectable and uh, it's treatable. Uh, uh, problem is uh, in, in developing countries, especially in uh, uh, rural, uh, semi-urban sort of settings, the pap smear is not a viable option because you need a pathologist, you, you lose women to follow up 24 hours. So the VIA method, you know, uh, inspection of, uh, of the cervix uh, after uh, washing it with acetic acid is actually a proven method because you can offer treatment to the woman at the same setting. It's known as a single visit approach. So the problem uh, that Jepago sort of we, we came to learn in our interactions at the, on the field is that the cryotherapy equipment uh, is 40 years old, it's like an abacus. And the challenge to us, to our you know, design teams was, can you build us something better that breaks down less frequently, you know, uh, costs a lot less than $2,000, can be repaired. So it, initially it sounded like, well, that's a very incremental project, right? You know, engineering students typically don't want to do something incremental. But some students and a, a student faculty team, they really took up the challenge. And they did not try to make you know, a better cryotherapy gun with better valves and all of this. The, the way this works is that it works on the principle of adiabatic expansion of gases, you know, in this chamber, and the, so the tip, the tip gets really cooled. So what they did, they also realized that, this is a funny story, that these, these devices were intended to be used uh, using uh, liquid nitrous oxide, right? Uh, and that's very expensive, not available. So. A lot of the health systems there, they procure um, liquid carbon dioxide from Coca-Cola because there's a Coca-Cola plant in almost every province in Africa. Uh, so they've substituted, it, it sort of works, but then the, these guns clog up even more. So our students actually focused on just, well, what can we do with liquid carbon dioxide? It turns out if you expand liquid carbon dioxide, it, part of it sublimates into what's known as dry ice, solid carbon dioxide. And that's at minus 77 degrees Celsius. So long story short, what they did designed was a single injection mold made of nylon, uh, a popsicle made of dry ice, the cryopop. So you have this device. Uh, it has an adapt attachment that you attach to the cylinder, turn on the valve, and in 30 seconds, you get a popsicle made of dry ice. You apply it directly to the cervix in a similar fashion as you would with your current cryo gun. And the temperature profiles, the freezing profile of cryopop is actually better than the best uh, cryotherapy equipment that's available out there. We have excellent results, animal results, preliminary animal results are very promising. It turns out that 
you know, this of course, you know, has a lower threshold for sterilization and all of those things, but it's much, much cheaper. You know, this, this, can, be ma this can be made for about 25 to 30 dollars. So it's, it's an order of magnitude, hopefully lower in price than the current equipment. Uh, but the best part is it's actually energy efficient. So from the same tank of carbon dioxide, which costs $400, they could previously do 15 patients. Now you can do 150 patients using the same tank. So now this has opened up the possibility, again, this is fairly early stage, this opened up the possibility that you could, instead of lugging around these 50-pound tanks of gas, you could only do these cervical cancer prevention camps in big locations. You might have the model of, you know, the midwife with a backpack, so two-pound tanks of gas would be enough for 10 patients. So these are all possibilities that can happen now because we have, uh, you know, a, a, an approach which involves taking a step back, looking at the problem, and trying to approach the problem with, you know, a completely fresh direction as opposed to iteratively tweaking what already exists. So that's my last slide. This is a quote that I love from Tor Lardell, who is, uh, you know, the CEO of uh, Lardell Medical, uh, one of our good partners and supporters in our global health program. And he keeps, you know, reinforcing this message to our students that innovation is not what innovators do. It is really, at the end, it is what customers adopt. And so all of this is fun and nice, but uh, as uh, Dr. Sangvi mentioned, there is an entire journey after, you know, even if you have understood user needs, you've understood stakeholder needs, and you've done your design, you know, completely appropriately, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of issues related to global advocacy, to commercialization, and, and uh, the approach we are trying to take is to have all of those perspectives uh, at the table from day one, not in a sequential fashion. So we, we are, with the help of JPAIGO, uh, you know, getting an understanding of what is the burden of global advocacy to get a new technology adopted international guidelines, even before we've actually started designing it. Uh, as you would in the U.S. context, right? You would understand what the reimbursement scenario is. You would not, you would never invest a dollar in developing a new medical device unless your reimbursement pathway is clear, unless your regulatory pathway is clear. The, the same abstraction holds true for the global health context, just the realities. The ducks that you have to line up are very different, but you still do have to line up ducks, that's all. So, so thank you very much for your attention, and uh, it's a fun, fun to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Somia. Uh, I think this panel has been really uh, incredibly stimulating, um, and I think we'll open it up uh, instead of me starting with some questions. I know we have about 20 minutes, so if we could uh, start taking questions from the floor. Is there a microphone? Yes, yes. please be loud. <laughs> Are the mics on? Um, uh, there isn't, uh, as far as I think, I think what, what is out there are uh, listings of current solutions. But may I propose a slightly different approach? I think that anybody who is trying to design uh, technologies for that kind of setting really needs to create partnerships with not just clinicians, but with public health groups who have an intrinsic understanding of their problems. Creating these things in isolation will not get you what you need. You absolutely need the in-depth understanding of people who are in that field. So um, there are so many fields, and there are, I think we, we are so blessed in the United States because we have 
immense number of public health schools which have got global public health programs who have a really deep understanding of the problems can articulate that very well. I'm, I, there are lots of websites where uh, the list of problems is written down, the knowledge is available, but I don't believe the understanding is actually available in those websites. The knowledge is available out there. For that understanding, I think you really do need to partner with sharp uh, uh, public health groups that are everywhere in the United States. Yeah, if I may just add to that, I think, um, I think exactly, you can get preliminary lists of, you know, grand challenges, the so-called, you know, we need to do something in preeclampsia, do something in PPH or in HIV AIDS. That's a no-brainer. But uh, at the level of, uh, the level of information that you need for uh, true product innovation, uh, that will be adopted by customers or information that is actionable. I think you there is you have to absolutely build partnerships uh, that involve public health and commercialization groups in addition to clinical groups. And just a small example from a uh, small anecdote from our students uh, just last summer or this summer actually, uh, one of the students was developing this, you know, it's an undergraduate team leader, I think, developing a gestational hypertension detection device and his hypothesis was that, well, if we put a cell phone battery in it, uh, since all health workers have cell phones, they will figure out ways to charge it and they will charge it. Um, and we went off of that hypothesis, till such time that he, in one of the validation iterations, when he was up in the mountain district in Nepal and he was chatting with the health workers face to face, uh, uh, you know, a very unique perspective came, which is that we actually have to pay money to charge our cell phones. We figure out ways to do that in the local shop and we do that for our own devices because we have we see value in it. I'm not sure we would do that for a government issued device. And of course, that's just one perspective. But but all of this sort of information, anecdotes, that also sometimes forms uh, an integral part of your thinking, and uh, you know may, maybe makes the difference between eventual customer adoption or not. Well, um, I would pose uh, a follow-on to that and. If I'm an inventor and I have an idea for a device and I want to commercialize it, um, how does that, how does partnering help me retain my intellectual property, assuming that we all agree that it's okay to do good and make money at the same time from our devices? Yeah, so a couple of points. I think, uh, I think if you have invented in isolation, you probably are referring to some seminal piece of technology that enables a product. I, I do not think you can, um, as an inventor, that we can make a customer-ready product without actually those deep partnerships. To your second point about IP and, and uh, you know, business and all of those things, I'm all for it, but one, one, one of the aspects I feel that uh, IP, this is again my personal opinion, IP is at times overrated when it comes to technologies and products for uh, for the base of the pyramid market. I think what is monetizable there is not, IP is a very small part of what is monetizable. It's really your, um, whether or not your your product truly, you know, delighted the customers, your supply chain efficiencies, your branding, uh, your quality assurance, uh, and that's, those are issues that the IP doesn't come in at that place. We 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 are so uh, used to the well-established Western model of healthcare innovation, which is, you know, investment will only come in if if there's a reasonable assurance that, you know, competitors will be held at bay, and IP is one of the pillars of that. Uh, that is quite often not true uh, for some of the te types of technologies that this type of uh, forum uh, is seeing, uh, where the you know, the, the breakthrough nature or the rocket science component is really subtle, but it's really, you know, lining up the ducks appropriately. So I think um, that's another point I try to make to my students, that if you can build very, you know, good business models and sustainable business models uh, and entrepreneurship models for taking these uh, to market, but perhaps it's not so much dependent on IP, but more so on your, you know, other factors. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I just wanted to comment and say, after you have finished the devices, you have produced them, producing them in the United States won't it increase the cost? Is there a plan that you would, uh, 
either partner with people in these developing countries and develop sites where production can be made so that the cost even goes lower and access is easier because, uh, I mean, ordering it from the United States, some people may never even know where to order it from. Are you, are you directing that to one of the panelists? One of the yes. I, well, I could take a crack at it. I mean, this goes back to the whole outsourcing issue, right? Things get, things get made uh, where they can be made most efficiently. So, same holds uh, true. I believe. I think the reality is same holds true for medical devices. There are certain things that can be done well locally, uh, but uh, certain things I think have to be made in China or in America, and certain things that can be made better in Kenya and, and Nepal. Uh, that's the reality. I do not believe we can make a, let's say, an entire uh, tablet computer, for example, uh, in, uh, outside of the existing manufacturing lines that already exist in major factories. So we have to factor that in, I believe. So, so let me just add, add, add to this. I think we, we need to understand that for resource-limited environments, quality is an even bigger requirement. Yeah. We just cannot afford low-quality products because we don't have the bandwidth to be able to buy these things repeatedly. So we need long-lasting, high-quality products that are low-cost and effective. So that's, that's sort of the big challenge here. So even the manufacturing has to happen. So from my perspective, one of the ways in which developing countries can actually make a better uh, deal is to come together and make advanced market commitments as nations. We, we've tried to apply advanced market commitments as a mechanism by which to get uh, global health products uh, out there, for example, vaccines and things like that. Uh, but countries probably need to come together and say, if, if all of the countries in East Africa came together and, and, and decided that we're only going to buy really good, high-quality blood pressure machines, Right now, all of East Africa is, is, is flooded with extremely cheap, low-quality blood pressure machines that break down in month two because they were not built for the dust that exists there or the, the tubings melt or uh, stuff like that. Uh, so everybody's buying those low-cost machines because they think they're there, but they don't actually work. But if all the countries in those groups actually got together and we could have WHO bring them together to create those market commitments, then we can get the right kind of manufacturers to manufacture them in mass and provide them. But, but in that kind of situation, you, you, you still have to have the free market economies. But in my opinion, you can drive that change happen if people are willing to come together around quality products. And to me, that's such a big issue in developing nations uh, right now. Yes. And I want to add to that. I want to add to that. Thank you, Matt. How should it be regulated, as well? Yeah, I, I think that I, I really believe that uh, global organizations like WHO have a really, really important role to play. Unfortunately, I am not too sure where they are playing that role right now. Uh, they ought to do it. Um, let me give you a really good example. I work in Afghanistan. Uh, when we all went out in Afghanistan, each one of us in many, many different groups went out, we suddenly created 28 different courses for midwifery. 
Every midfield school had a different curriculum. Every midfield school had a different agenda. Every university in the United States was helping Afghanistan develop different things. It took an unbelievable amount of coordination to get people to come to the table to agree to one thing, because we all believe in so much diversity. I'm afraid that kind of diversity really is not good for development when resources are scarce. So it is really important for us to look. So we can be very well-meaning and go out to an individual hospital in Malawi or individual place in Kenya and whatnot and try and solve the problems. It's a good thing. But if we want big scale change, then we do have to coordinate within what's happening within governments in those countries, get buy-ins at the global and regional level. I showed a very awful chart up there in my presentation. I actually really mean that for us to take any technology from the, the point of, from, from the point in which you have actually shown that it's effective, to actual adoption is a massive exercise. If you have too many of those technologies, then it's almost impossible for us to make the right kind of decisions, which ones to invest in to get to the end run. So I would say that this is a place where global agencies now, I will say that right now, here in the United States, USAID is playing a very, very big role in trying to coordinate the, 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 uh, the investments in global uh, investments around certain very key things. I think one more point here. We absolutely need evidence. I'd love to see the evidence that distributing tablets to students make a difference. Uh, I'd love to see the evidence that any of the technology we work are not just effective, but are making actual public health difference. That evidence then can translate into uh, actions around it. Uh, to me, if there are many, many groups who are working on different areas, one way of rising above is to demonstrate that it's going to make the big difference. Not just that it's effective technology, it has to be in, in a real setting. It's being adopted, it is used, it is uh, actually changing uh, health stats in some ways. Now, if we can get to that point, then I think those technologies will rise and will automatically get to the next stage. Unfortunately, uh, you are saying that, but we see in our countries, UNICEF, uh, Save the Children, they are compartmentalized the countries. Everyone is working in a certain area, and yet these are the bodies which would have thought that they would come together and sort of deliver uh, something as a, a unified body. So I really don't know who, who, whether WHO, even WHO brings out their policies, they are also you saw that document, it's so confusing. It says they always have these detailed things which are not applicable to the, cadre, the, the kind of cadre we have in, in developing countries. So I really don't know whom we are to approach at this point in time. Who, who is going to do what? Because it is really a mess down there in, in the developing countries. And then another issue again is what about the lack of a regulatory agency to regulate these devices uh, in the developing world. I mean, how are we going to make sure that we do have safe and high quality devices, as, as Harsh had suggested, that we need? Any so ideas? Can I just uh, address the regulatory issues? I think almost every developing country, including uh, countries uh, that I know in Africa, uh, have some form of regulatory uh, systems. I think these regular systems are, in fact, the, the challenge is not having those regulations. The challenge is making sure those regulations are implemented and adopted. So for example, in the case of Uganda, I think there is every, the Uganda government has got an extremely fine uh, roadmap of where they want to go. And donors are expected to come and align to that roadmap. But you know, donors often don't do that. They go off on their own. So that's a challenge. But that's a challenge, in my opinion, that countries have to deal with. Uh, if we allow people to come in those nations and do things that you know, do not align to a national direction, then I think, frankly, we have, developing countries have ourselves to blame. Uh, we need to become a little bit firmer as developing nations in understanding where we want to go and seeking the kind of help that will help us get there. Um, I believe that Uganda, for example, is a country in Kenya, my own country, have got some very good directions already set out in terms of technologies, in terms of public health direction and whatnot. 
um, we have the responsibility then to ha help move those directions. Um, now, in terms of regulation, I think most countries in Africa uh, will adopt certain types of technologies which are adopted at the WHO level. So at the, if, if you get global um, adoption or recognition of a technology, then majority of countries in, in those nations will actually adopt that. So getting WHO approvals, pre-approvals, and, and things like that is a very critical part of any kind of technology we build. Uh, uh, and I, I think uh, there's a real openness at WHO to start working on these things even in the early development phase. Uh, so I, I would absolutely encourage anybody who's sort of developing technologies that are relevant for uh, developing nations to, to engage with WHO in a variety of different ways uh, so that uh, the, the various kinds of regulatory, so we, we can bypass many of the other types of regulatory challenges if uh, at the WHO level there has been adoption. Well, I want you to join me in thanking our panelists. It's time for us to close. <laughs>